I, I have to start off with an apology. So, so Groves was originally in this spot, and he couldn't make it. And so I'm kind of a last minute pinch hitter. And I feel like I'm Yogi Berra pinch hitting for Mickey Mantle. <laughs> I mean, I'm good for a few good laughs, but don't expect a big swing. Uh, um, this uh, this uh, paper that I'm presenting is is uh, pretty different from from what uh, has been presented so far, and that's good and bad. Um, the good is that it's going to be a change of pace. The bad is that it it might be a bit harder to fit it in with the rest of, of what's been discussed. But I mean, I expect we'll be able to see connections as as the as the talk um, as the talk goes on. <clears throat> so the scope uh, of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be a bit smaller than the scope of the talks that have, that, uh, have been uh, uh, given. Have data. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> um, I will mention some data <laughs> uh, briefly, um, <clears throat> but let's see how it goes. Uh, I want to start off by talking about one of the most influential theories in the economics and sociology of religion. So in the last uh, 30 years, more so in the last 20 years, there's been a big change in the way that sociologists have thought about uh, religion and religious activities and religious groups and religious behavior. And uh, one of the big changes is that people in sociology have started bringing in ideas from economics. And this has given uh, new insights in, into the field. And there are some economists that have also participated in this. Um, and one of the most influential ideas in this new set of ideas is one that is... Um, comes from uh, a guy named Larry Yannacone, and uh, let me mention his idea to you. And to, to economists, is not going to be a, a really surprising idea, but in the particular context in which it comes, it's very illuminating. Okay, So the, the theory here is not very complex. It's just an interesting application. <clears throat> so what he said is that um, religious groups, one of the fundamental problems they have is dealing with free riders within the group. So the many different, many the religious groups produce all sorts of goods, okay? Some of them are public goods, some of them are private goods, some of them may be club goods. So if we think of that four box chart that, that was presented earlier. Um, so th let me give you some examples. So there's lots of joint production. So they try to, religious groups try to collect money from um, uh, people to pay for different activities, to build buildings, to pay clergy salaries, to do any other activities they want to, to undertake. They also rely on people to donate non-monetary um, uh, uh, contributions. They need to donate time, uh, effort. These things will improve the experience of the group. They help to reinforce uh, bonds in the group. Um, they can actually help to reinforce the beliefs that are taught by the group and so on. But of course, there's a, there's a free rider problem because there's a positive externality. And so the more effort you put in, uh, it's good, that's, that's good for me, but uh, I have a, a, a and if, if uh, uh, the people are uh, <clears throat> fairly selfish in their uh, preferences, they'll have an incentive to, to contribute less than what would be socially optimal. Okay, same, same story, you've all, you've all seen and heard it. But uh, if, if, if they all free ride, then the quality of the good is, is quite low. Uh, and so in order to, to be successful uh, uh, in providing their collective goods, uh, the religious groups got to overcome the free rider problem. Okay, so Yannick Cody says this is this is a key problem for religious groups, and he says you know religious groups have have like other groups, non-religious groups that are facing similar problems, have devised certain mechanisms uh, to confront this problem. So he proposed the one particular um, solution that uh, is is an interesting one. Okay, uh, basically he says that. It, it wouldn't be such a problem if the religious groups could just identify who were the uh, free riders. Okay? So the problem for the religious groups is that they can't identify who the free riders are because it can be hard to measure certain forms of contributions. Now, you might be able to measure people's monetary donations if they pay a check and um, you, can, you can just keep track of how much people paid. Um, it's harder to, to monitor things like effort. Uh, and so there are, there, there are dimensions of, uh, in which people make contributions in which it's very difficult to measure. And, uh, and so the standard method that, uh, say, an economist would propose to resolve the free rider problem, which is just, we'll find out who are the free riders and kick them out of the group, okay? 
or, or, <coughs> or charge them money in order for them to charge them uh, some sort of uh, um, um, fee unless they contribute. You just can't do it. So what you have to do is you need to screen some other way. You've got to somehow identify people that are going to be more committed and more willing to be contributors to the group once they're in the group and try to get all the other people to stay out of the group. And so what he proposed was that many religious groups use uh, certain behavioral standards, behavioral codes, as a way to, to, to do this screening. So they re can require certain what look like bizarre and, and what we might say irrational things, like wearing your hair in a particular way, or shaving it entirely, wearing a particular type of clothing, um, avoiding particular consumer goods or foods or other things. That are some, but the, the thing is that these have to be easier, relatively easier to observe. And if these things are easier to observe, you can identify people who are at least performing these activities and say, OK, these are the people we're going to let in the group, and these other people we're going to kick out of the group. So you use these easier to observe, possibly stigmatizing behaviors as a mechanism for screening. And we, I use the word stigmatizing because the idea in, in his theory was that these behaviors are ones for which there's associated some sort of social stigma. So you think about wearing a full cloak over your head with just the eyes showing. If you're in France and you're wearing that, well, there's a tremendous stigma okay, attached to that. Maybe less so in other countries, but um, there's, a, there's a cost. It's inefficient because this is not contributing to the production. However, uh, if it's effective in screening out people that might be more likely to free ride, screen in people that may, might be less likely to free ride, once this screen takes place, the group may be able to sustain higher a higher uh, uh, degree of contributions than it would otherwise. <clears throat> so free riders are, are, are screened out of the group in this way. So Yannacone, um presented this argument. And this <clears throat> has, uh, it, 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 and he has uh, certain predictions uh, with this. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll wait for another slide to get to those. But, um, um, so this is a standard thing in economics where we identify something out there, some sort of non-market behavior, and then we say, well, I've got sort of an information story for how uh, actually this is a rational response to some, some uh, setting of incomplete information and some sort of market failure. Okay. <clears throat> and he, he, he says that this is going to apply particularly to strict religious groups or sectarian religious groups. In his mind, he's thinking about <coughs> excuse me, religious groups today. He's not thinking about primitive religious groups, though he doesn't claim that it can't apply. He just his, his examples and his data are with with uh, modern religious groups. And there's a distinction between club goods and public goods that's going to be very important because the group is going to have to be able to exclude people from some goods. So there's going to have to be some sort of excludability. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to understand the signaling. Version. Um, but are, are we thinking that people who are willing to wear hair shirts uh, are more likely to be generous? Is that, um, yeah, why, so there's why, some. Why would we think this, this would work? <clears throat> why would we think this would work? So, so there, there, there are obviously different types of people. Yeah. Some from maybe have a higher marginal benefit of contributing than others. Right. Okay, and so. In the equilibrium, those people would be willing to pay this extra stigmatizing cost in order to be in the in group. And, and, and in particular, in the equilibrium, if they also know the other people are going to be screened out, so there are even fewer free riders in the group. Um, but, they, but their financial donations are not up there. Is that, is that what the model is? That's right. But in the equilibrium, I mean, in, in, in principle, so his papers aren't game theoretic. Uh, mine is going to be game theoretic. Uh -huh. But yeah. in equilibrium, yeah. people, will, people will know that this is an equilibrium. and it will be consistent with their, you know, rationality constraints and all that. So you're, you're going to give us a lot of that. I will at the end. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there's huge assumptions with the make that they're willing to be stigmatized uh, only if you're willing to put in the extra effort. Right. Okay. Right. So yeah, I'll give you a model at the end. I, um, but I'm going to just kind of give you the words for a while. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you my simplified version of what I think is his theory. And, and uh, he's, he, his is not a game theoretic. His, his work's not a game theoretic. Okay. So um, I'm going to give you a, a simplified version. <coughs> but uh, I'm going to give you my model. It's not his model, because you'll see that 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to revise this theory a little bit. So what I'm going to do today, and, and what I do in this paper, which, by the way, is, is just a working paper, and a, it's a still being revised, is I want to take his theory, but I want to put it in a more dynamic setting. And I want to argue that religious groups actually don't want to completely eliminate free writing. Uh, because, uh, in, in, I would argue, in most of these religious groups, there's, there's going to be a, a, a dynamic component associated with something we call religious capital. You can think of it as a type of human capital for now. So I'll come back to that. I'll be more specific about that later. Uh, and in a dynamic setting, <clears throat> if you screen out all the free writers, you're going to be potentially screening out your future potential contributors. So this, this uh, paper is really from the point of view of a group that's thinking about its survival over time and thinking about who should we let in and let out of the group when the people that are considering to join or not join have particular utility functions and uh, preferences uh, and, and, and incentives. So I'm going to give you later a, an overlapping generations model that should uh, clarify what I mean by all this, but I want to get through some of the more important ideas first. And then once I do this, I want to um, restate Yanukone's theory uh, in light of what I'm trying to say, which is that groups, in this context at least, uh, and, and, and I'm thinking about religious groups, though I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how this can apply to other groups, non-religious groups or secular groups, uh, they should really be thinking about dynamically managing free writing, but not necessarily completely eliminating it. And, and instead of thinking about stick, using these stigmatizing behaviors to screen out all free writers, you're going to try to screen out those people who are less likely to ever become contributors in the future. That's the subtlety. <clears throat> uh, here's some literature. So Yannick was kind of the originator of the theory. He, there are some people, mostly sociologists, who have tried to test his theory in some ways. I'll give you a flavor of the data, and I'll maybe mention a couple of the problems with interpreting it. But uh, at least at first cut, it looks like there's some, subs there's, there's some evidence to support his, his um, theory. I'll mention this notion of religious capital. I'll have a slide on that, so I'll talk about that later. This idea of managing free writing uh, in religious groups, at least, um, is fairly new. There's one paper I found back in 2002 where, where the author kind of mentions it, but he doesn't present any general argument um, about it. Um, I uh, mentioned this in a paper that I wrote about the, the LDS church. There's a guy uh, in Connecticut who wrote, uh, a sociologist who wrote a paper about, uh, he's written some other papers as well about mega churches and how they, how they try to manage free writing. So, um, let me clarify. His paper is not about that, but he mentions in his paper this is an aspect of, of, of uh, what the groups are, are, are thinking about uh, when they're um, planning activities and organizing themselves. So what, what this paper is really trying to do is, is present a, um, it's a specific model, but it's more general of an argument than what is out there in the literature already. <clears throat> and so literally what I'm taking is my version of the stigma screening my simplified game theoretic version of this stigma screening story, embedding it in a kind of a human capital, uh, embedding it with like human capital, putting them, just putting them together and seeing, seeing what happens. <coughs> and by the way, so I teach an economics of religion course here for freshmen. My TA is here. And so this is, <laughs> this is something I do in a lecture, but um, I mentioned this to my students uh, in the class, but it's not published yet, but uh, um, so that it won't be new to you. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so that original stigma screening idea um, had some particular implications. One was that strict churches would tend to have smaller proportions of free riders, and that they would be more homogenous because they're kind of screening some people out, some types of people out, and that the contributions, if you look at the distribution, they'd be less skewed. And that they would produce higher quality and higher quantity goods. Of course, it's hard to measure quality and quantity of goods. You can look at donation, monetary donations, which is what people have tended to look at when trying to empirically test uh, Yannick Coney's predictions. And what you find is that, in fact, 
Um, <clears throat> and in fact, I'll, I'll show you some, some uh, so, so first I have to say strict. By strict, we mean um, the degree to which the religious group requires a, a certain types of behaviors for sort of being in good standing. And you can go all the way from, say, ultra strict uh, down to, say, ultra liberal. This is, this is a table I took from a, a book by a couple sociologists. Um, other people have given different classifications. You can kind of imagine there's a continuum, um, and they find people find it useful to, to put these on a single dimension and, and kind of locate different denominations at different uh, places on this strictness dimension. Uh, and uh, people might kind of disagree with the exact placement, but this is kind of the general pattern that, that all the sociologists who make such classifications give. <clears throat> Uh, and what you see if you look at monetary donations is that, in fact, the stricter groups, both in terms of absolute monetary donations and in terms of percent of income, contribute more, on average, than members of non-strict groups. Um, and um, there's lower skewness in the... <laughs> sort of selection issues in the data uh, that, uh, that aren't being accounted for. And to my knowledge, no one has accounted for. Okay. But I'm not an econometrician, and I'm not going to account for them. I'm not going to do any regressions or anything. But, yeah. One thing that puzzles me a little, uh, so these, are, these typically, I would suppose, the financial constitutions are observable. Right, which so is I don't see why there's a... Yeah, uh, the free rider problem is that um, you don't know what constitutes like an appropriate contribution. You, you don't know if the person has made the, what's deemed by the group to be an appropriate contribution. So I might know that you donated $5,000, say, but I don't know if, if you made $5 million or if you made $50,000. So what's considered to be a fair and appropriate contribution uh, according to some, say, standard of the group? You know, this is a... It's not so clear that you don't know my income as well. Well, it's the third call. There's, There's some noise. In California, you can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's above, if uh, people have used the monetary donations, uh, um, I, I would say it's no, it's, I'd say it's a noise <coughs> measure. Uh, any, any information you have about their income is probably a, a, a pretty noisy. There are some pretty wealthy people who drive pretty bad cars. Right? And you should know if they donated by would be interesting. <laughs> well, you can look at you can look. Oh, you, this is this is from this is these are just numbers I pulled from uh, the General Social Survey. Interesting. So this is self-reported. Well, it's particularly interesting because driving a you know car that's much below their actual means would be a signal something. Well, else. there's signal that they have less. Signal that they have. Could, would you have to think that they have a, a there, this is a contribution to the church, right? Right. So would you have, be able to get another call that, that's their charitable contribution? More yeah, you find there's a big correlation. You find you tend to find correlations between this, if I remember right, but I, I, didn't, I don't have that. But this is contributions to the church because, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about this in terms of donations to the, to the religious group. Right. But, uh, but I'm just wondering what proportion of their contributions they make they make to their church. Well, that's uh, that would be percent of income, right? No, no, no. What pro proportion of, of their contributions? Of their contributions, they. Oh, oh, right. I see. What you're saying. Yeah, I don't. Uh, you know, whether that might be. That might be. They might. They might have a question on that in this data set. So what? To what other? How much money did you donate to other charitable yeah. organizations? Yeah, that might. Yeah, be I mean, right. like these universalists, they might give a lot of money to. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Doctors absolutely. Without Borders or something might be their religion. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 I don't dispute that. I, I, and again, I don't want to make too much of this. This is just sort of sure. showing you that there there could be something to this story. Okay, there's there's a correlation between the strictness and the and the contributions. What's causing what? Uh, you know, I don't want to make too big of a claim. There's a theoretical story that um, Yannakoni gives, but uh, I'm going to kind of I want to I actually want to just use this as a springboard to talking about my idea. Yeah. I was just going to say that. I mean, it seems to me there's a content. People like LDS and more so Amish. So your boss is going to be in the same church. Maybe he's one of the you know, people on the committee that's that you should pay. So that you're, that, I mean, these 
tightly knit religious communities, there's a lot more information about any kind of comparison else. So your, your uncertainty is uh, I mean, So you're saying there could be other types of monitoring. The stricter groups tend to have type. So this is another, this is kind of off topic, but stricter well, groups. Well, somewhat alternative explanation to the same observation. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've made that point to, no. to Larry as well. Uh, the, the stricter groups tend to have more tightly knit social networks. If you, you can suggest sure. that there's better monitoring within yeah, those groups, like I, I totally agree. Your boss is, is yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> it's a different. It's a different. That's a different model. Yeah. And and I made that point. I mean, that's, yeah. it's these ideas like the, about the diamond market and, and uh, these ideas that these markets are aligned with the you know, crystallization problems here. Uh, they're uh, built on ethnic networks. That's the way those arguments often look. Right? Yeah, there could be. There could be. Other theories that that predict the same table. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Yeah, uh, you're right. No, no question. De definitely <coughs> say if you're on the finance committee of the Unitarian Universalist Church, you probably actually do have a very good idea of what the various <coughs> members are actually. Uh, it, it may be that in general you have more tightly knit strict communities, but at the same time, this this information about roughly how much somebody makes. It's actually not something that's terribly hard to figure out. I think the fact that your boss may be on the same committee is doing something other than the yeah, fact yeah. that he knows yeah. how much you make. You get hurt how much you make. Yeah. Right, so no question, monetary contributions and the degree to which those are <coughs> appropriate from the point of view of the group um, is something that's much more easier to, to identify than, than other, some other thing like effort, which might be much less, uh, much harder to, to pin down. Um, and his theory is just about something we might just call effort. Uh, and it might be money. I mean, it's something that has a cost. Um, and it just so happens that in the empirical work, people have looked mostly at the money con monetary contribution because that's about the only thing we have a measure of. You can get measures of time, but it, this is kind of a difficult measure um, well, anyway, let me let me move on. I, I don't I don't want to make too much too much of it, but um, th they are numbers to give us uh, kind of some context. Okay, so here's this now. Now the rest is me. Okay, so that was all that was all um, other people. Um, but uh, so if you look at these groups, you know, <clears throat> strict groups. If if their job is to weed out free riders, you know, they're not really doing the best job. Okay, so first of all, if you look at some groups that have really high levels of activity, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Even they, according to some research, have about half the people who really don't actively witness. They go out and actively knock doors and talk to people, which is one of the most important things to do in that, in that religious group. Okay, so even Stark and Yannakoni in their paper, they mentioned, boy, you know, there's still a lot of variation within the group. Okay, a, a second thing is that religious groups, they often do a lot of things to reach out to people who aren't contributing. And so megachurches <coughs> might be the best example of this. They're very welcoming to people who contribute little or nothing in terms of money or other, other uh, forms of contribution uh, to the group. But they're very welcoming to, the, to, to, to these people. And, uh, as, and I mentioned in, in the LDS church, a, sim a similar thing is, is seen. A lot of people who don't contribute much in money or other uh, types of contributions um, are still permitted, you know, just by the basic practicing of the church, to have all sorts of benefits that the church provides. And so, in my mind, you know, if you look at this, you say, well, the fact that there are free riders in a church, in a, in a very strict church, isn't very damning. Because the theory just says, the theory just says we're screening out as, as, be, as best we can. The screen doesn't have to be a perfect screen. So that's not very damning to, to Yannikoni's theory. But the fact that these religious groups are actually actively trying to engage people that aren't contributing, that's more damning to the theory, okay? Because that suggests that the religious group knows who some of the free riders are, if you want to call them free riders for now, and they're actively going out and courting them. Okay, that's, that's not nowhere in Yannikoni's theory. So what I'm, so I'm, I, I'm going to propose that we need to think about this a, a, in a dynamic sense. <clears throat> and you might already see where I'm going here. Okay. Um, is that a hand or is that? I was guessing. You're guessing. Okay. You're probably <laughs> guessing right. So. <clears throat> um, 
So I want to say, you know, let's really think there are two different types of free riders. And the first type is really what we think of with free riding. That is those, we'll call them insidious free riders. You know, they're the ones who, they exemplify the spirit of free riding, right? They're intentionally not contributing, like they're just trying to take benefits when other people are paying the cost. But then there's this other, there's this other dimension, there's um, not dimension, uh, this other category, shall we say, of people who they're new, they don't really know how to contribute, maybe they're just visiting, they're potential members in the group, maybe they're the children of the current members. Um, they don't contribute much to the group, but yet they are actively um, courted by the group. They're free riding in that they enjoy benefits and they're not contributing much. How much benefit do they enjoy? Well, it can, it can vary from group to group. Okay? And um, I'll, I'll show, in my model, it'll be quite stark and it's going to be an ab quite an abstraction. But, uh, um, so, the, 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 and the important difference between the, these two types of free riders is that the latter, right, the first, the first type, they're just, they're just lost causes, right? But the latter, they have this potential, at least from the point of view of the group, they have a potential to become high contributors later. And uh, this is where um, I bring in this notion of religious capital. So religious capital is actually, fun, oddly enough, a <coughs> term that Yannakoni has thought of, but he never thought to combine his, his two ideas. Um, <coughs> capital, uh, to an economist, is a, is a good that's produced, but not so that you consume it, but it's, it's produced so that you can use it to produce another good that you want to consume. Uh, and so there's all, and one type of this uh, is, is something we call hewing capital. So it might be training, skills, education that uh, is produced in you and it resides in you uh, and you use that to go out and produce other things uh, of greater value to you. Well, there's uh, religious capital would be, in one part of religious capital would be the, a type of religious human capital. So the set of skills, experience, knowledge that you have of a religious group. This will allow you to function more and be more productive in the religious group. It also might allow you to sort of more enjoy or, or, uh, or appreciate whatever the group is providing. So there's, on my next slide, I'll get into sort of a supply and demand. There are two sort of components, uh, both the supply and demand side to this religious capital. There's also sort of a social capital component to this as well, uh, which might be the set of ties and friendships and social connections you have in the group. The more those, are, the more those go up, the more you might benefit from, from being in the, in the group. So there's this human capital, social capital. They're both, they're both uh, to the extent that these are connected with the religious group, we're going to call those religious, religious capital. Yeah? So are you basically saying that they're giving out free samples for nothing to take away? Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. I didn't quite hear what you said. They're, the churches are giving out free samples oh. so people start getting addicted. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So it seems to me the problem is Two out of the three uh, church groups don't do this, right? So Orthodox Jews, Amish, uh, there's a lot of other groups like that. I mean, uh, Hutterites, Sikhs, <coughs> and there's lots of these uh, groups that are not involved with that. But nonetheless, have lots of, of, uh, of really strict uh, requirements. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, they're not going to grow as fast. They don't grow as fast. Yeah. But they still have the strict requirements. Yeah. So, so. Um, um, I think this model is going to fit more closely those groups that are interested more in, in sort of some sort of right. growth. Yeah, okay. but that's that. I agree. I, I think I think uh, this static model might might match them a little bit better because they're just sort of there are these strong lines and you know there's not as much effort made to to get people addicted. If we want to use that. Well, in the case of the Amish, they, they, they give the kids a chance to get, to get out. Yeah, exactly. But they're not really. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and now, now the kids that are born, there's an effort made. I mean, there's. I, I don't, I don't want to say this model doesn't apply at all. Uh, I would say it might not apply to the first approximation, but I would say that it applies maybe to a second approximation because the children that are raised are still. There's going to be a lot of effort put into socializing them, yeah. and that's a, at a tremendous cost to the to the adults. Now, <clears throat> and well, I mean, a lot of the costs are the fact to keep the kids out of contact. <clears throat> Right. So later I'll talk about you know what's the optimal screening point, but I, I'm not going to say m many things deep about it. Just acknowledge that a different group might have a different 
So their screening filter is going to be even higher than, say, some, let's say, like a megachurch. By the way, there are lots of megachurches in Orange County, so if you okay. drive within an hour, uh, uh, drive within five minutes from here, you can hit a couple of, a couple of them. So, uh, <laughs> Crystal Cathedral. Crystal Cathedral, Mariners, Saddleback, right? The Rick Warren. Okay, so these are all. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm not sure the Orthodox Jewish groups don't <coughs> proselytize. <coughs> they have various mechanisms by you know, not outside of Judaism, but of the. Uh, oh, uh, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. Of, uh, upward, upward mobility. Uh, upward mobility. Uh, and in fact, bring people back. So and, in fact, yeah, and in fact, there are these Chabad groups that are run on many of the campuses that are Orthodox groups. That and there, the, your method of contribution is not how much money you pay, but how Orthodox you become. But they tolerate kids who come in there who aren't because maybe they'll get home. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Okay, so let me let me speed up a little bit to get to the model. I think that's what you guys are waiting for. But to, just to pound at home, so there's a demand and supply side to this, uh, uh, to this increase in religious capital. It will increase your marginal value of consumption, and it can increase your marginal productivity for the group. Now, in the model, I'm just going to have the demand side. There's going to be kind of a consumption capital. Okay, it's going to have sort of, and, and, and it can grow as you experience, uh, as you have, as you have uh, stay in, in the group. I'm not going to model supply side, just the demand side to keep it simple. Uh, and so, let's say Eve learns more about her religious group's doctrine. Well, she might enjoy the weekly sermon more because she has a better context from which to appreciate what the priest or pastor is saying. Um, and also, her ability to, say, lead the children's class. You know that might also increase her ability to produce for the group uh, can can go up as her religious capital goes up. Same thing with social capital. The benefits of consuming as well as your ability to help produce goods for the group both go up uh, as your capital goes up. So in other words, <clears throat> this religious capital accumulation in in the people uh, can increase their contributions uh, because it increases the marginal uh, benefit of contributing a, a, a dollar or a, 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 a degree of effort or a unit of effort. So someone who's a small contributor today may, may later become a, a large contributor as their capital grows. So over time, if the group is interested in surviving, they, and, and if it's the case that people start out um, with really little religious capital, then the only way for, them, for, for the group to get high contributions is for them to make these investments so that they later have high capital. Okay, so, so in this religious capital context, their, their groups to survive are going to pretty much have to make investments in, in, the, in, the, uh, um, <clears throat> in the future generation. So the free, free riders of the second type are a type of costly and risky investment. It's costly because you have some free riding. You have people that are taking away benefits at a tremendous burden. But, and it's risky because not everyone who you work on is gonna, gonna catch on, um, but it's a, a necessary investment. Okay, um, but you, know, you don't want just anyone to free ride, right? You wanna be able to identify who are the people who are likely to develop the capital. And so this is where we can come back to this screening, the stigma screening. So the stigma screening in this dynamic religious capital context is saying, you know what, we're not trying to screen out free riders. We're trying to screen out those who would always remain the first kind of free rider. We want to we wanna screen in the second type of free rider because we hope that they'll later become uh, contributors. <clears throat> so the stigma screening serves this dynamic strategic purpose. Contributors in this framework, they're not born. They're produced by the group. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I think I'm being repetitive here. I think, I think you get the idea. A few clarifications. <clears throat> this capital, in this, in this theory that I'm proposing, develops only um, through involvement with the group, not through, say, private devotional activities. Um, second, I want to distinguish it from, say, a firm's investment in human capital in a worker. Uh, the context I'm looking at is one of, of a production of uh, some sort of collective production of some sort of club good. And a firm isn't necessarily engaged in the production of some sort of club good. Uh, and so in, the, in this club context, we have this free rider problem that might not be there when it comes to human capital investment in your workers. 
Uh, and uh, I'm using a sort of rational addiction model with consumption capital. Uh, but um, I think the idea would, would, would apply in, in spirit uh, if you had some other type of addiction uh, that wasn't rational addiction or if you had uh, some form of coercion, you know, the parents forcing their kids to go to church so the kids start forming capital. Um, <clears throat> the, the main idea is that this cap is that people aren't born with much, and in order for the group to get high contributions, they've got to they've got to invest in people. Um, and uh, I'm going to give sort of a, ra a rational choice story uh, that matches this uh, uh, this idea. Um, but I'm not going to explain how religious groups figured this out. Um, there's a question of you know whether they just religious groups that have stumbled upon this are the ones more likely to survive, or whether religious groups are actually quite strategic and forward thinking, and so they've devised this. On that, I, I can't, I'm not going to speculate. <clears throat> okay, so here's slide 15, here's the model. <coughs> so there's going to be a single group in each period. Um, so this is it's an overlapping generations model. In each period, you're going to have n individuals born, and each each individual is going to live two periods. We'll call them childhood is period one, and, and their first period, and then adulthood, second period. They each make two choices. So each person is going to decide whether or not to join the group, and then what, how much to contribute to the group. This con contribution is this C. So C of player I, who's born in period BI, in period T, uh, this is the cost. Um, F, this is the, the club good production. So you take the, the sum of all the contributions uh, of all the members and then divide it by the, the, the size of the group. Hold on one second. And then this term is the, is the consumption capital addiction term. Okay, so this is your, so you're gonna start out with K1 and we're going to kind of think of that as being small. And then if you join the group, no matter what you contribute, as long as you were in the group, in the next period, you're going to, you'd have high capital K2. Okay? And so for now, I'm just going to have, the, this is the simplest model I could think of to get this idea. Now, we'd imagine that it's a lot more complicated. You know, this K might depend on the efforts. Uh, you know, there are other things, but I think this is going to be good enough for the, for the, for the letter. This is the, the, the period in which you're born. It's an index. It's an index. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and so, and for now, I'm just going to assume all the individuals that are born are identical, and then later I'll talk about there being different types, and that's where the screening will, will cut the stigma screening will come in. And I'm interested in looking for what I'll call a partial free rider equilibrium. Under what conditions is there an equilibrium where all, where everyone joins? Well, first, before I have multiple types, an equilibrium where everyone joins, but only the adults contribute. The, the children don't. Yeah, Tony, did you have? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip all the math. Uh, let me just show you a few results. So let's first look at a setting where you can't observe any of the contributions. <clears throat> so there's no monitoring. Uh, and, and everyone forms capital. All the children who join the group will form capital and become high capital uh, 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 who, if they join the group, will, will become high capital adults in the second period. So I, it's straightforward to show that this equilibrium, where you have the children free riding, we'll call it free riding of this other sort, and the adults not free riding, will exist if the children's capital is sufficiently low and the parents' capital is sufficiently high. <coughs> Excuse me. This should be pretty intuitive. <coughs> If the parents' capital is pretty high, sufficiently high, they'll want to contribute. <clears throat> and if the, if the children's capital is, uh, is sufficiently low, they just won't find it worthwhile to contribute. So you can imagine the, in, the, in the extreme case, K1 is equal to zero. So the children get no benefits when they're children. I, I don't see in here where the number of children you have is. Is it just you're replaced the, by it's, one individual? The, the, so for now, the, the, it's, it's not reproduction. It's just n people are born in each period. There's no fitness. <coughs> okay, so it's just n the people are born. The same number born each period. The same number born each period. They're not genetically linked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is the contribution amount for each of them, or is it zero or one? There's an equilibrium. Uh, 
Uh, I, I don't remember what I did in the paper. It's been a while. Let me, let me look. I think it might be zero one, one to keep it simple, because you have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I did zero one to keep it, to keep, I kept it discreet so that the conditions would be sharp. Yeah, because you worry about an interior, in, yeah. I, I think it was zero one, that's yeah. right. So we might think about these as assistant professors and full professors, there's nothing, <laughs> you, you, I mean, you're, you're new members of a group and you're old members of a group, and that's it. But you have to decide whether to join the group. Yeah, but there's but nothing, you, none, each year there's a certain number that come in and a certain number that go out. There's nothing in here that really treats these as children. Absolutely. I'm just calling, yeah, that's right. It's a label that's not meant to imply re reproduction, just, just age. But it's just time in the group. Well, so I, didn't, I didn't use the labels in, to, in reference to time in the group. The, the labels refer to the length that each, each individual is alive. Well, what, how, does that, uh, how does that matter? I mean, you're either in group, you, you, you come There's, into the group and you're in category A. You don't come into the group, you decide whether or not to join the group. You're born, you have to decide, do I want to be in that group or not? I'm going to live two periods. Do I want to be in the group or not? That's, that's, what, uh, that's what the decision is. So well, you can decide that when you're a child, and when you're an adult, you also make that decision, and then you're dead. Yeah, OK. I'm pretty harsh. Economists don't live as long as I think I'm, I, I don't think I see what you're thinking about, so I'm not well, sure I'm just saying that they, I, I don't see anything in this model that has to do with children and adults. It could be, you, it does, just, you're you right. decide to you're take right. a job at UC Irvine, you're right. and you're here for a while, and then you move into the, I've been here a while category, and then you leave. Think of it as a club. It's just two different levels. It's yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, it, 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 putting it in, 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 in an applied demographic framework, None of the demographic features really are Okay, here. yeah, if you don't like these labels, I'm not, I, I, I thought they would just be helpful, but if you don't like okay. them, yeah. No, okay, it's your paper. <laughs> I no, just this, is, this is feedback I need to hear. It, it's, I, just, it's just I want to understand. Well, I just think it's, I, I guess my point is it's more, it, it, it's more general than, than uh, a yeah, demographic model. I, I it, of, it has to do with uh, two categories. When you had the page before of uh, uh, members that you might want to bring in for a yeah. while, to get them. Right. There are two levels of membership, basically. And you get to stay in the first level. <coughs> Say, like, probationary yeah. members and, and full-fledged members. Yeah. Right. I, I, I agree. I, I, I haven't extend. I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to address an issue in a particular literature. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I think I, you're right that there's, that this, there's scope for this outside so that, for sure. sure. He's telling you that what happens is that the council will close on a law firm. Yeah. Three partner and partner. <clears throat> I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true because I mean, things of that type. the law, the the, uh, the 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 grunts in the law firm are put through. They're put through a lot of work. But in this in this equilibrium, the, in this equilibrium, the the potential members aren't doing anything to help out help the group. At least not this equilibrium. Now, now, if if K two is really 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 huge, <clears throat> you know then. It might be the case that you can have an equilibrium where even though I get no benefits today, I'm willing to join and make a lot of effort just so that tomorrow I can, right? And that would be the law firm equilibrium. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in, in this partial free writing equilibrium because that's what I think is matching what I observe in the religious groups. Okay, so, and I would say I think these conditions match, right? People are, people are born probably with little or no religious capital, unless you think there's a God gene, which I guess could be true if you read Time Magazine. Um, people are probably born with quite little, and, and it has to be uh, uh, developed in them. How much time do I have till oh, I... Oh, you have till uh, about 2.10. <coughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry minutes. at 1.45, so you have <coughs> eight more minutes. Okay. Um, so here's a different setting where so now, I wanna, what I want to show is that um, the thing that I'm talking about is much, now I'm going to say it's much, it is more general than this religion context because, in fact, if you can observe all the contributions, if you even don't have a problem with this, this issue of can we observe the efforts, like this was part of our discussion, well, you know, you can really see how much money people make to some degree. Well, I'm going to show you this equilibrium. It even exists in that context. 
right? And the, and the issue again is, you know, when do people want to contribute? Even if you know my effort, um, if I don't get any benefits today from contributing, I'm going to have this incentive to not contribute today. And so you can, and, and uh, so the group can be, uh, can be okay with this equilibrium in which only the adults contribute and the children don't. So, uh, so even if perfect exclusion is, is possible, perfect monitoring is possible, you can still have this equilibrium because the capital, it's the capital accumulation that's driving it, it's overpowering sort of this worry about stigma screening that Yana Kony was talking about. <clears throat> um, this is the setting really that, that brings the two together. Suppose that of the N people that are born, only Y of them have a chance of forming high capital. N minus Y never form high capital if they join the group. Y of N form high capital with some probability alpha. Then, you know, it's just they're, they're, the math is a, 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 they're, it's, it's uglier, but you get similar results. So if you have, and so now, now the issue is, okay, now suppose we do the stigma screening. And so there's some cost you can make some people pay, that's, and that's observable, like wearing a certain hairstyle. Uh, and, that, uh, and now, excuse me, in this setting, if K1 is low and K2 is sufficiently high, and this stigma cost B, I shouldn't have used B because I used B for something else earlier. This is a different B for behavioral cost. Uh, if that's in a middle range, then you get this equilibrium. Um, why? Well, the K1 and K2 makes sense. You've already, you already know that intuition. Why the B in the middle range? Well, because if the B is too high, you're the Amish. Okay? And no one, you don't get new people to join, possibly. But if the B is too low, then you're not screening anyone out. So you need B in this middle range to screen out this, these people but, and, and have these people come in. But if, that, if, this, if, the strict, if the stigma cost was too high, these people wouldn't, wouldn't even join. So the Amish case is probably where you know, there are more than two types here. Children of members have a really high alpha. Other people have a lower alpha. Maybe some people have zero. And they're just screening in a very small select group. Other groups are screening in a, a different group. That would be my story, at least, in this framework. And my, that might not be compelling for you, but that's kind of how I think about it. And in this, there's <clears throat> there we have this equilibrium where we have these two types of free riders, where, where we have two types of concern about two types of free riders. We have those who might, who might form the capital, I'm sorry, those who might not form the capital who were in the group, uh, and those who haven't yet, have the, haven't yet formed the capital, they're also in the group. So we have this, this um, what I say would match what I think is out there um, in, in the real world, where religious groups are actually actively courting um, uh, people who aren't yet contributing. Okay, so uh, in, this, in this argument I'm giving, right, stigma screening is working in a dynamic way. It's not screening out free riders, it's screening out people that would stay free riders. <clears throat> and so the groups actually have a much more complicated problem. They've got to balance homogeneity with heterogeneity. So they want to have enough of the different types of people in the group so the group still survives over time. But you don't want to let just anyone in the group. Okay? So it's this balancing act that this model is trying to illustrate. And so it also suggests that some forms of heterogeneity are going to be crucial for the religious group to survive. So you just don't want a group of only clones, right? The Borg and the Star Trek. You want, and that's a different, now that's a bad example. <laughs> but um, you want some degree of heterogeneity uh, that's important for dynamic success. Um, so I would argue that, you know, this literature hasn't distinguished between um, these different types of free riders. In fact, they've never thought of the second type, probably because we don't really think of it as free, free riding. We wouldn't even call them free riders generally, uh, because they seem to be serving some purpose for the group. And um, I think, though I, I, I confess I haven't thought too hard about it, but I, I, and I think some of you have already made this, this last point, which is that you know, there's nothing about religious groups per se in this model that makes it apply only to religious groups. Any group that's got some sort of club good component to it Right, there's some collective production, 
Um, there's there, um, but uh, you need people with high capital tied to the group to contribute. You know, any any group like that's gonna. So so in in and in Yannickoni's original paper, his paper wasn't about religion per se. It was about sex, religious sex. It was about communes, collectives, any sort of collective group that was facing this free rider problem. So I would say that any group for which his theory was thought to apply would also apply. Uh, would also be relevant for, for the model that I'm presenting. Uh, in the future, I mean, I think there's, there are more question, uh, uh, there are a lot more questions. Groups vary tremendously in the degree to which they exclude certain types of religious group, uh, religious go goods from, from people in the group. Um, some groups, um, you know, choose to do these, some sort of screening much more than other groups. Uh, <clears throat> why? Why are they? Why are, is there so much differentiation? Um, different churches have different <coughs> institutional arrangements. Some are more hierarchical, some are less so. Even churches of similar strictness can be very different organizationally, right? So, does this? How, to what extent does this factor in uh, in this dynamic management of free riders? Um, I, I think there's scope for case studies here. Um, so, there's a, a student here at UC Irvine, for example, who's going to be trying to look at mega, uh, a local megachurch to see um, about how, how, how the administrators in the church, how the clergy in the church think about free writing and, and ha try to handle it. So uh, uh, maybe later this year uh, I would, I'd have something better to say about mega, um, a local megachurch. Um, and then, you know, a question about internally how the religious groups might um, uh, use different norms to try to support this investment process. Um, I, I'd say it's kind of another interesting uh, aspect of this. So um, that's that's it. That's the last slide. Um, Birth rates. I just, 
at least the evidence I've seen, they, there's it's both birth rates and active recruitment. Though I mean, maybe a different study. In which? Oh, oh yeah. and what what can no just uh, for religious groups in general? Whether so what, what, what gets the credit? I mean, I can I mean, say in reference. There's a paper by two sociologists in Berkeley about the growth of conservative. But no, no, no doubt the birth rate plays a huge, probably sure. the biggest part. I, I don't dispute that. Until the last ten years, point of view, yet you can model all the growth rate. So, so I, um, yeah, I, that, I, 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 that, I, that, that sounds fine. I, I don't. Um, so I. It seems to me like there are like alternative strategies for, for, for institutional growth. One is you, you lure people in and get them addicted. To these crazy well, but see that, but, but. But, but you have to do that. You have to combined combined do that with children. Hat story and sex. But, <laughs> I said the orthodox Jews combine that by wearing hat story and sex. Yeah. <laughs> but see, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. But it's. Just, but I, 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 if I understand you right, I, I, I'd say that the mechanism I'm suggesting about applies either way, right? Like I'm just talking whether you're born into whether your parents whether you're born into a family of a of a group or whether you're an outside you're seeker. Suggesting there's a correlation between high birth rate. And well, I, I would I'd probably say that um, if you're so you have, so there's three types, okay? Some of them are have parents who are in the group. So, okay, some of them. So, so your alpha is higher if you're if you're if you're born into a, a family that's in the group. That's that's. I mean, I, I don't. But it's the same mechanism. I mean, even the children that are born in your group still have to develop the, the capital tied to the group. Yes. Right. Well, and that's your picture of how it works. I mean, my picture would be. I mean, the fact is that it, at least in the Protestant progressive conservative versus versus liberal Protestant denominations, it's about nine to ten in opposite directions. Adult practice. So 90% of the conservative Protestant denomination, kids born into that denomination, choose to become conservative Protestants if you want to make that choice. Yeah, there's more logic. Uh, I don't think that's a very good model of what's going on. I think uh, uh, kids, they have beliefs that they get as part of being vocalized in a particular environment that then, that then cause them to make. So can I not call that capital accumulation? So I'm just calling that capital accumulation. I, well, I, I don't see that. Think of it as, uh, I, I, well, this is a long story, but, oh. but uh, it's not very much like capital in the sense that it's 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 not something that produces uh, revenue or anything later. It's just uh, it's it's like you get your priors as part of growing up in the group, not not you get some endowment, and uh, your priors are you know that God exists, that he you know he believes that driving a uh, pickup truck is a deadly sin, and that you. Radio and all those things, and and uh, that's the way you understand the world. And I don't think that's very much like capital. Okay, that's, that's, no, that's, that's another um, a point, point taken. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have your hand first. Okay. A, a technical question: Is a one size factor to you that we have K one K two is fine? No, I think positive. Because yeah, that's actually uh, the crucial one. So <coughs> look at the inequality for K two. If n is large. Uh, the denominator is <coughs> pretty close to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. You can expand it in zero shares, and you could say that it would be something like 2n times f prime of half, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so 2n over f prime of half. Uh, so that says that k2 has to be really, really big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe that's why they have to promise you heaven or a partnership. Or a partnership. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, it would be easy for you to extend this model to one where you, you vary the amount of time you spend in different groups. It doesn't, you've got a, one unit in each, but that would be so. You decide how long people can stay in this uh, free riding category. Uh, oh, right, right. So, so uh, okay. So you're saying you know if they're in the group for two years and they're still not paying any dues, then uh, you know. Well, you I mean, your model assumes you stay equal times in the two. Groups. Yeah. So well, that, there's only one group. No, Either in it or not. Yeah. You, the two groups are the novices and the uh, adults. Okay. The H classes. The two H classes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this says you can stay, but you could vary that easily. Yeah. It wouldn't, okay. It, I see what you're saying. And uh, and that would be a sensible thing to vary because uh, because you could say I mean, what the, we'll, we'll let them we'll let them be free riding for two years and you know there are lots of organizations that do that. I uh, I, I was given a membership. In the American Mathematical Society, when I was a graduate student, and that was 
good for five years or something, then I'm going to start. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, right. so that, 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 that was a, that's a device that, is, or you could have multiple categories. You say you stay here, right. and you move up to that, and then, right. So, so I, I think in, I think in, uh, so, <clears throat> we think about other, other ways that uh, the model could uh, better approximate reality. Um, you know, there are, there are still other dimensions. Um, well, I'm not just trying to approximate reality, but to, con to introduce another control parameter that you might manipulate. Oh, that would be an interest. Okay. Else. <coughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, as to follow uh, Rob's remarks, it seems to me Rob was suggesting that an alternative explanation for the stigma, stigmata <laughs> is that uh, there are ways to shut out outside ideas. It isn't about solving Oh, it's shutting off outside influences. And one reason why I think that might be right is you know, there are lots and lots of other organizations in the world that have free rider problems, and almost none of them use these stigma things. At least I don't think they do. So, uh, but if this were a successful method of dealing with free rider problems, we're trying to have a little goofy hat. But everybody thinks they're cool. Yeah, for yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> the tools and other sort of uh, and other sort of. Uh, I don't know. It's, it can be different ways. I mean, yeah, gangs. I mean, if I were to come in here with a particular shirt on, I don't know. I might get stigmatized pretty severely, right? I mean, if I came in here with a, I don't know, pro someone shirt or something. What is your other circle? I agree that there's lots of signal on the end of your analysis. Yeah. So, but I think they, they, may, they might not be so, they might be more subtle. But yeah, I'm, I'm subtle enough that um, that it's probably pretty different. You I mean, so, so the, the question you're getting is why do religious groups tend to use these things, other groups don't? Yeah, especially, I was thinking of them as being um, well, the intrinsically unpleasant things that, that you really don't like to do, but maybe that's the wrong way to look at it. Thing. So many of them are, are aimed at uh, social isolation. The dietary um, references you can't, you can't eat with somebody. Um, the Amish are very explicit about it. Um, you know, where do you send your kids to school? Do you send them to the, to the Amish house? Um, uh, like a, like a GM Supreme Court decision allows them to take their kids out of, out of local schools. So, all these things are about while well, you've got the kids in the program with the state, uh, don't, don't let them. seem to be pretty good at finding out how much people earn. It's, it's, poss it's poss certainly possible. But the second model is that you actually provide, or the actual model, the model with the, um, with the, um, or the two, the, two, the two time period model, there's actually a reason you wouldn't actually want to use that information. Um, if you're actually a church, if you're actually a church, and you, if I'm in a church and someone comes to me and says, why haven't you contributed so much? My, my likely reaction, or if I'm the first period of low religious capital, would surely be to leave. Right. So you actually, so that whole problem at the beginning seems it seems that you've answered, seems you've answered it. So I think that's a, a group norm, right? Yeah. That's internal to the. I mean, the group is gonna. Some groups are more open about monetary contributions than others. Yeah. So, uh, um, but uh, I mean, so I. So on the question of monitoring, so I've talked, so I've talked to Larry Yanukovych about this a few times. I mean, I, I think that the stigma stuff is not the biggest. I mean, I think that there's more monitoring than he lets on, uh, and I think groups are, you know, because you know you're in a, a, a group that's a community, even if, you know, and you can see them quite frequently. Right. I mean, people have a pretty good sense of who else <coughs> other people are and, and how, how much how and, and they're you know what, what they may be contributing. So I, I I think I think his 
I, I don't think his story is wrong. I think it's one part of the story. Is it the most important start, part of the story? I'm not even sure that's true. But I still think that whatever story he's got still it needs to be revised because I think, I think it, the dynamic context is a lot more appropriate for what he's talking about. That would be, um, that's the way I see this paper right now. Uh, so, uh, well, anyway. So do you think this sort of model might be applied to international negotiations where the religion is you get to join the World Trade Organization or something of that sort. In the first couple of years you come in, you're, you're allowed to um, not follow all the rules. But after a while, um, uh, you really have to, uh, if you want to, you, know, you get sucked in and then if you want to continue to play the game, you have to. Uh, so the benefits of being a member have to increase over time, though. That's the, that would be the key. Right, so maybe the more integrated you get with the rest of the world, yeah. if that if that condition is going to hold, then um, I guess possibly I, I don't have a model in my mind, so I'm not mm -hmm. I'd be hesitant to speculate too much. Yeah, Don and I, it's not exactly the same thing. Don and I are involved <laughs> with an organization called YASA, uh, which uh, to which countries belong, and uh, and well, it's often the case that the first couple of years they come in, they put, pay lower dues, uh, but if they want to stick in, then they have to uh, pay the full dues. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, so it's sort of like this model. We're scheduled for a break now, and uh